Morning, everybody. Let's read chapter nine of Woods Runner. Wounds. I'm really sorry for this part, guys. Untreated battle injuries often led to gangrene, which causes the body to literally rot away, turning first green, then black from infection that travels rapidly. Because antibiotics were unavailable in the 18th century, amputation was the usual treatment. Due to the horrific odor of gangrene, surgeons could smell the patient and make an accurate diagnosis. If the patient was not lucky enough to benefit from amputation, maggots would be introduced into the wound in an attempt to aid healing. They would eat away at the infection. Barring the surgical removal of body parts or the use of parasites, doing absolutely nothing and letting the patient die was the only option at the time. Chapter 9. Strange Dreams. Visions of unreality. Endless screams that started with low grunts and became more and more shrill until they cut his soul. Dreams of his mother dressed in all buckskins, ladling some kind of thick stew with a wooden spoon into a wooden bowl, chewing tobacco and spitting off to the side while she held the bowl out, shaking her head. He ain't anywhere near right yet. She spit her wad of tobacco juice out again, brain scrambled and gone. Then a trap door came down, a lid, something thick and dark, and, the, and there was no light at all, just blessed darkness and sleep, sleep, sleep. No more screams. No sense of time. Once he tried to remember his name and fought with it for a minute or a day or a week or ten years. He couldn't tell. More dreams. Scattered. His mother, this time wrapped in the blanket with stringy black hair hanging down at the sides of her head while she chewed an obnoxious cud. She disgorged it, slapped it on his head, and tied it on with a filthy rag, spitting more tobacco juice out and nodding. Got to get the pizzen out or he's going. she's going to rot on him. It was as if his eyes never really opened, as if he saw everything through closed lids, and the images that swirled through his mind were so mixed that they became a blur. Now remember, in the last chapter, Samuel had just been knocked out by a tomahawk, so this is all just dreams in his head. Night, day, night, day, light and darkness seemed to flop and flow over each other. Pictures would stick for a moment and then go. A horse, then a cow, then his mother leaning down, still in the dirty blanket, greasy black hair hanging down the sides of her head, raising the, the poultice and gritting, spitting more tobacco juice. Coming clean now, she said, clear pus, looks clean as spring water, all the yellow gone. And then bouncing, incredibly rough bouncing, as if someone were jumping on a bed while he was trying to sleep. He would pass out in pain, rolling waves of pain. Finally, a picture stopped, just stopped in front of his eyes, in front of his mind, locked in. It was dark, or night, and he was on some kind of wooden frame lying on the ground. A fire burned nearby. When he opened his eyes wide, the light from the fire seemed to shove a lance into the middle of his head. He grunted in pain. He closed his eyes and waited for the rolling pictures to begin again. When they didn't, he opened his eyes, but only in a slit. The image was the same, a bed frame of some kind, a fire, and this time, less pain from the light. As he watched, an arm came out of nowhere and put a piece of wood on the fire, then withdrew. He tried to move his head and see where the arm went, but the pain was so intense he nearly lost consciousness. He lay back and closed his eyes, opened them again when the pain receded. Where, who, the words pealed in his mind like a bell, echoing around inside his head. A figure appeared next to the fire. Not his mother, but a young man with stringy black hair and a cheek full of tobacco juice. He leaned down, his face close to Samuel's. You in there, righteous, or are you going away again? I'm, I'm here. Who are you? John, John Cooper, but most just call me Coop. Where? Long story that. We'll be about 12 miles from where you got that egg on your head. 12 miles in distance, more than that in time. When, I don't remember, some Indians. I think I shot at one and then nothing. Why did I shoot at an Indian? Can't tell. We come on these Iroquois and some red coats. We'd already seen what they took. They took and done back at Miller's Crossing, so we snuck up proper and took them on. I remember you were shooting. You say we. Where are the others? Asleep. I'm the night watch. Plus, I've been doctoring you, and I thought you might lose your light during the night. You've been breathing like an old pump. 
I guess you was just sucking air hard because you didn't die. Of course, it could still happen. I had a cousin got kicked in the head by a mule. They fra fractitious mules. And he lived for nigh on two months before he lost his light. He never talked none except now and again a kind of moan like somebody stepping on a duck. Then he just up and died. Samuel closed his eyes, fell to spinning. Then, as if a fog were lifted, it all came back. I was tracking Ma and Pa. They, I mean the Redcoats, the Indians, hit our place while I was looking for bear. They killed most everybody but took my parents and a few others captive. Coop nodded. We saw them all around the fire. Ropes tying them together. What happened to them? Coop shrugged. Wasn't much of a fight. We fired once, reloaded, laid out another round, and they ran. Them redcoats had wagons already hooked up, and they piled the captives in the wagons and lit out. We couldn't shoot no more for fear of hitting the captives. The Indians just drifted away like smoke. That would have been that, except one of them put a musket ball in Paul. It was in his gut. Awful place, that. We knew he was going to die. Ain't nobody comes back from a belly wound. And kept waiting for it. But he made it four days. He gave up his light last night. No, night before. Died screaming. It was bad. Surprised it didn't bring you out of your stupor, the screaming. Kept everybody up all night. Samuel closed his eyes again, trying to put numbers together. Died one, two days ago, after making four days. If a belly wound took four days to kill, and it happened the day of the fight, but Paul died two days ago, how long since they took the captives? Since the fight? Five, six days? You've been out six days. We like to not found you, and when we did, we almost left you. Thought you was with the raiders. Me? Why? Well, you wasn't with us, so we thought you was with them. But Carl did some thinking on it. Carl's my brother, and he's the one to think on things. And said, look how messed up your head was when they clubbed you, and look at the bullet hole in the Indian you killed. That's a honey of a light rifle you got. And how could you be with them and still get clubbed and shoot one of them? So we took you with us. I've been out six days, closer to seven, counting the night. And did you say that we'd come 12 miles? Coop nodded. First three days, no four, we let you lay. Everybody thought you would die and there wasn't no sense dragging you. Then there was Paul with his belly wound. If we tried to move him, he would scream like a panther. Then we rigged up a drag and started to pull you back pull you back of one of them oxen they left behind when they ran. All the bumping. Coop nodded, spit tobacco juice in the fire, and listened to it hiss. We couldn't stay too long, and thought you could just die just as well dragging you as you could laying up somewhere. If we left you, something would, would have come along and ate you, so here you are. My head. Coop nodded. Good cut from that hawk. Carl took some deer sinew he had and an old needle he carries for fixings and sewed it up right pert. He said in case you lived, wouldn't be as much of a scar across your forehead. Coop smiled with some pride and added, It come on to having green pus and everybody knows that's bad, so I made up a spit and backy poultice and tied it on with a piece of rag. Pus cleared up in two days. So I've been ly laying for six days? Another nod. Coming on seven. Well, how? With a start, Samuel realized he didn't have any pants on underneath the coarse blanket that covered him. How come I'm not all messed up? We took your pants off, got them wrapped in a blanket pack with your rifle. Indian must have been in a hurry or he would have took it. Sweet little shooter like that. Also got your possible's bag and a powder horn. What you feel under your rear is fresh grass. Anytime you mess, we just threw the old grass away and pulled... In half a foot of fresh new grass, slick as a new calf, or maybe slick as a baby's bottom. Maybe I should put my leggings on. Only if you ain't going out of your head again. I don't think so. Suits me. I was the one having to get new grass all the time. You ain't et nothing other than a little broth I got down you one time and some water now and again. Man could go a long time without food, no time at all without, without he has some water. I'm starving, Samuel said automatically. But with the words came the feeling, and he realized he was hungry as he'd ever been. You ought to drink something soft first. Coop handed him a wooden bowl with a mixture of broth and meat. Go slow. This is from some salted ox that they was cooking when we jumped him. Samuel took the bowl. 
He tried to drink slowly, but as the taste and smell hit him, he couldn't help gulping at it, meat and all, so fast that he gagged and threw up. Slow, Coop repeated, coming back with a blanket roll and putting it on the ground next to Samuel. You'll found, found her if you don't go slow. Samuel started over carefully. There was silence as he ate, chewing completely before swallowing, small bites, small swallows. It's like fire, he thought, when you're cold, fire moving through your body. He ate the first bowl, handed it to Coop, and watched him refill it, this time with broth and chunks of glistening fat as well as meat. The second bowl he drank and ate more slowly than the first, and while he ate, he made a mental list of questions to ask when his stomach was full. Why are you here? How many of you are there? Where are you going? Is there any way you can help me find my mother and father? Are you? Will you? Can you? Do you? Questions roaring through his mind. He finished eating. He lay back. He opened his mouth to ask the first question, and his eyes closed at the same time, and he was immediately asleep. And the last thing he thought as he went under was that he still hadn't put his pants on. American Spirit Although poorly trained and weakly led and improperly fed so badly that the soldiers sometimes had to eat their shoes, the Americans took comfort from fighting on home soil and usually had much higher morale than the British. While they were often outnumbered and fought with inferior equipment, this spirit had enormous an enormous effect and took the phrase morale is to fighting as four is to one to heart on the battlefields. So what do you think is going to happen next? Do you think that Samuel is going to set off on his own? Do you think that he's going to get sick again? Do you think that this new group of people is going to help him? Let me know what you think in the comments below.